Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. Matthew writes, Now Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So what we have here is, in these verses, Jesus calling four of his apostles. He's calling Simon, he's calling Andrew, James, and John. Now, when you look at your Bible, there are multitudes of people who heard the message of the gospel. From these multitudes came disciples. From these disciples came the apostles. A disciple is a lifelong learner who has attached themselves to a leader, a mentor, learning the teachings of that mentor and learning how to explain those teachings to others. We, as Christians, have been called to be disciples. But out of the disciples, the Lord Jesus Christ called 12, who were also called apostles. Apostles are people who are called by God, delegated with authority, and sent out. And so not every disciple is an apostle, but all the apostles were to be disciples. And what we have here is Jesus calling four of these who not only are moving from being called disciples, but they are also referred to as apostles. And so we're looking at the calling of four of these men, as mentioned, Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Now, this is not Simon and Andrew's first encounter with Jesus because we know that according to John chapter 1, verses 35 through 42, uh, Andrew had been a disciple of John. And we know that Andrew had brought his brother Peter to meet Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1, verses 41 and 42, it says, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. And so Jesus had already spoken to them and ministered to them. But now they're coming into what would be called full-time or permanent discipleship. When you look at this verse here, let me give you a second thing here as a, an introduction. In verse 18, notice how it says, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers. When you read your Bible, and I'm assuming all of us do, when you read your Bible, in the Old Testament, as well as the New, you're going to discover that the Sea of Galilee is actually referred to by different names. It's called the Sea of Kinnereth in the Old Testament. It's also called uh, Lake Tiberias. It's referred to also as the Lake of Gennesaret. And so there are different names associated with this one body of water that we call the Sea of Galilee. The reason it's called the Sea of Galilee is because it's actually a good-sized lake. It's like uh, eight miles from the east to the west. It's about 13 miles from the north to the south. And at its deepest point, it's about 720 feet. And so it's a good-sized body of water. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is there ministering in this location. So it says in verse 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen. During that time there were different ways to catch fish. There were basically three ways that the fishermen would fish. They had what we today simply call hook and line. They also had a, a, a system of a drag net that would be strung between two or three uh, boats and it would it was a, a dragnet. It was used in that fashion. And then they had a, a different kind of fishing that was called net fishing. And the net itself was probably around nine feet in diameter. And they would, they would take this, this, this uh, net and they would throw it into uh, the water just offshore. And that's what's taking place here. And so Jesus Christ is ministering to these people who are busy at work. As it says, there, they are casting a net into the sea, they were fishermen. But notice verse 19, what happens? He said to them, follow me, and I will make you 
fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And so in the first encounter Jesus had with his men, he was intending for them to have solid faith in him because obviously he's going to save you before he sends you. But now they're his followers. He intends to send them out into a ministry field. And so as we look at this, I want to develop a few things. Let me lay a foundation, and then we're going to look at some practical application of this. But as we look at this today, I want to show you a couple things. One thing isn't really noticeable when you first read it, but it's something you find later in your reading of Scripture. And that would be that these men are intended to be the building blocks of, of the church. These are men who are going to be foundations of the church, these apostles. And that's because the church was designed by God to continue past the first century. You know, we as believers are called by God to impact the world until the return of Jesus Christ. And so these men are really what we would call his building blocks for the work of the church on earth. How do we know that? Well, Ephesians 2, 19 and 20 in the New Testament book of Ephesians, it says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. So they were the building blocks for the work that would continue till the return of Christ. And the church has been created by God with a purpose. It's to shine his lights in a sin darkened world. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the apostle said, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, into his marvelous light. So we are intended as a church to be transformed agents of a transforming message. And as believers, we are then sent out to share what God has done for us. It's really important to develop this at this point. God never intended us, believers, to keep to ourselves what he's done for us. God doesn't intend to do a work in me on a personal level and then for me to remain silent about it. God intends me to take and speak concerning the things he's done because what he's done for me, he can do for anyone. And we really have to have that kind of idea in these last days when so many people seem to be so quiet about their faith, it's time for believers to open up. It's time for us not to be, you know, pugnacious and belligerent and argumentative and, and all of that, no. But at the same time, if God has touched our lives, we ought to tell somebody about it. We ought to share about the good things that God has done. That's what he intends us to do. There was a man, the Bible speaks of him, is a man that was in a, a region called the Gadarenes. And this man had been severely demon-possessed. Jesus and his men had landed there on the shoreline, the eastern shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And... Uh, this demonized man came running out of the tombs and he was shrieking and people were so afraid to go past this particular region because they had tried to bind him in, in chains and shackles and, and he had broken them and he was in the, in the tombs and he had sharpened stones and he was constantly harming himself, cutting himself, shrieking and the people were so afraid and yet this man comes rushing out from that area when Jesus lands and and he runs up to the Lord Jesus Christ and begins to speak to him. And, and as this takes place, Jesus ultimately casts the demon out of him. There were actually, Jesus said, what is your name? And he said, Legion, for we are many. And so there were 2,000 demons within this man. He was severely demonized. And we know the story of how that Jesus granted them permission to go into the pigs. And the pigs rushed over the lip of that cliff there, fell into the Sea of Galilee and were drowned. And this man was now seated there in his right mind. And Jesus begins to minister to him. It says in Luke chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. He said, go and tell somebody what God has done. So God does not intend us to keep to ourselves what he's done for us. He wants us to go out and tell others. And God intends the work that, would, uh, that was done to continue to be done into the future. And these men that we're looking at here in, 
in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 following, these are men that God's intending to use. Now, as I was looking at this, I began to look at some of the things that related to their call, and there are some things I'd like to share with you about the calling of these men. I would remind you, first and foremost, though, that as we look at these men, yes, this is the calling of the apostles, but these are what would be called transferable concepts. These are things that not only can apply to them, but can apply to us as believers. Because I'm speaking about these men being used to minister. And sometimes today, especially when I say those who are in ministry, you may immediately be thinking in terms of paid staff members of a church. But every one of us has been called by God to serve him. Every member of this fellowship is equipped for the works of service. That's what we're supposed to do. So every member is a minister. And so it doesn't matter if you're a staff member. It doesn't matter if you're called pastor or elder deacon or whatever. The fact is, this is something all of us are intended by God to do. And when God calls you to serve him, there are various things that apply to all of us. For example, in this particular case, we, we first see, according to verse 18, that God's calling and timing may interrupt your life. These men had an occupation that was picked out. They were fishermen. They were businessmen. But Jesus had different plans for them. And I've discovered that God has a way of interrupting our own plans in order that he might bring us into his. And his plans are always better than ours anyway. If I had my way, if I was following my own script, at this moment, I wouldn't be married to Marie. I'd be married to somebody else. Because I wanted to marry anybody who'd say yes. She, she just happens to be the first one who said yes. But I would have, if I had my way at one time before I met Marie, I definitely wanted to marry somebody else. And if I'd have been married to that person, I wouldn't be here right now. Another thing I think about is I wouldn't even be in Chino. I would probably be in San Luis Obispo, which is where I've been wanting to escape for many years. Because I like it up there. But God has better plans. God has plans for you. And Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God wants to do a work, and God wants to use us to do that work, and he has plans for us to do those things. And you may have a plan for yourself. You want to go to school, you want to get your degree, you want to do a variety of things and end up doing some occupation, whereas God may say, well, that's great that you have all that training, but I'm calling you to something else. I got saved. I sensed a call into the ministry. I started going to Bible college. My plan was to go through school. I was going to Biola. Biola was a five-year school to get your bachelor's degree. Then you have your master's that you get after that. It takes you to two to three years. My plan for myself was to get my bachelor's, move on into my master's, and at the age of 31 to go into full-time ministry as a pastor of my church. That was my plan. It's interesting how that the Lord had different plans because I didn't graduate from Biola. I didn't get my master's degree, but I did get into full-time ministry when I was 31, actually 30. And so the Lord had his plan for me. The plan was for me to do what I'm doing. And I had to learn to flow with his plan rather than to try and make him flow with mine. And one of the things you see about this also is that, and I want you to notice this, that these were ordinary men cast in a net into the sea. They were fishermen. And so God delights in using ordinary men to do extraordinary things. Again, they were simple fishermen, but God intends to make them into men of God. And part of what he is teaching them is that they don't have the adequacy, but he does. Luke 18, 27 says, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And that is the overwhelming testimony of Scripture. When you look at yourself, you may be saying within that you don't have anything to commend yourself. You don't speak well. You're not good looking, perhaps. You're, you're not from a, a, a real well-known family. I mean, a variety of things. You may not be well-educated. But when you look in Scripture, the overwhelming testimony of Scripture is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You look at Abraham, the father of the nation of Israel. He was an idolater. 
David, who became king, and Amos, who was a prophet, were both shepherds. Jeremiah was simply a young man. We see Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John as fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector, and Luke was a doctor. God takes ordinary and makes it into extraordinary. If God can do that with them, here's your question to apply to yourself. If God could do that with them, why can't he do that with you? What is it in your life? that God wants to do, that you're not allowing him to do? What is it that you're nervous about, you're afraid to trust him in? Listen, when I got saved, one of the things that was hindering me from getting saved was the fact that I'm shy. I don't, I don't want the center of attention. I don't necessarily feel comfortable there. And so the idea of having to stand in front of all of those people, the idea, I, I still remember the prayer, I mentioned it to you recently, how that I said to the Lord, I can't stand because Arthur Blessed was saying, stand to your feet. I can't stand because, I said to him, because I'm shy. And I still am. And there have been times when people think that I'm a bit stuck up. Maybe I am, I don't know. So what, shut up. No. <laughs> but I am shy and reserved. I've always been. And the idea that the Lord would place me in front of people is a cosmic joke, is something that I would never have planned for myself. My plan for me was a very simple plan. My dad was a truck driver. I like driving trucks. I want to be a truck driver. As a matter of fact, at one point I was an assistant pastor and I resigned my position. And I told Marie, my wife, I said to her, you know, I'm no longer serving in pastoral capacity. The Lord has released me from that obligation, that service. I said, maybe it's time for me to move up to San Luis Obispo. I said, I have a friend named Nick who is actually a manager over a bread company. It's a delivery company. And so I said, I could go up to San Luis Obispo and deliver bread. I said, I've been delivering bread for a long time, the bread of life. Why not just real bread for a while? She wasn't into it. And so the rest is history. The rest is history. You know, don't run away from what God wants to do in your life. God wants to do abundantly above all you could ask or think. He has something he wants to do in you. And you may be saying to yourself, but I'm not extraordinary. That's fine because God is. And all you need to do is trust him. God delights on building on the foundation of human impossibilities. That's so that no flesh will glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, Paul said it like this. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Why? So that no flesh should glory in his sight. God can use anybody, anybody who is available. The question simply is, are you available? Now, God, when he calls you, intends for you to respond immediately. Immediately. Notice verse 20. It says, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And so the Lord wants us to, to, to respond. He calls you to follow him. And then over your life, you seek him through prayer by his word. His spirit leads you to where you're supposed to be. Is like what it says in Psalm 37, 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. The Lord has a way of working. I'm from Norwalk. I get saved. Go into the army, get out of the army. September of 1973, start teaching a home Bible study in Norwalk. My brother Frank, a year later in August, August 4th, 1974, my brother Frank gets saved. Frank doesn't have a church close by, needs to be discipled. My sister Madeline and I climb in my 1965 Volkswagen, start driving from Norwalk to Ontario in September of, of 1974. My brother used to live right off of San Antonio and Holt, right by a park there close to, I think it's B Street. And I used to go to this little apartment, and I would teach my brother, it was my sister Madeline, my brother Frank, and me. That was our Bible study. I came just to speak to him about Jesus. 
he began to invite friends. When he invites friends, their co-workers, a young woman named Marie shows up. Marie comes in. Two weeks later or so, she gets saved. She needs discipling. I take the task upon myself. <laughs> She's from Chino. We get married. Now, prior to getting married, I used to live just up the street from here. If you went to Philadelphia and you took a left, you went to East End, just go about half a block, a block or so. Off to the right, there's this place, there's a little bay hay and feed or something like that. There's this, this house there. I used to say it's a rock house, but people got the wrong idea. It's not a rock house. It's, it's a house with rocks on it. The house really rocks. And I used, to, I used to live there. I had Bible studies there. Marie would come and uh, meet me there, and we would drive past this location when the chapel there was new. And we would drive by, and I still remember telling her when we drove by, man, that's a great-looking little church there. That'd be a great place to have as a church. Little did I know that the Lord was ordaining my footsteps to one day pastor on the property that I used to drive by when I lived just up the road. God has a way of putting your, your, your destiny, if you will, your, your future. He has a way of bringing you into it. And while he, all he wants us to do is just to respond, to follow him. And, and to follow his leading. And he wants to do something. Because when it says follow me, that word follow is a word that speaks with, of an immediate reaction. No delay. Come now. So he says, I want you to move now and this is what I want to do with you. I want to make you fishers of men. So he said, follow me. My premier responsibility is to follow Jesus Christ carefully and closely. Remember, Christianity is not a system. It's not a denomination. It's not a simple church. It's a savior. And we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're followers of him. And as we follow him and pursue him, he opens up doors for us. And he says to us this, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And so as I follow him and delight myself in him, he's saying, I am the one who's going to make you into the fisherman. So he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me. Don't pattern yourself after someone else. Let Jesus Christ fashion you into what he wants you to be. Here's something, if you're a single young man, or even a single young woman for that matter, this could apply. I won't pretend that I had a lot of dates when I was growing up because I didn't. I was shy and I didn't ask a lot of girls out. But when I did ask somebody out, I didn't know how to date. I didn't have a clue how to date. How do you date? So what I did is I did what a lot of young men do, I guess. I, I'd ask them, would you like to go out? And if they said, well, yeah, I'll take a chance, I'd say, um, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? I would get to know them, and I would say, what kind of food do you like? And they'd say, whatever it is. You know, I like grasshoppers on seaweed. And I'd say, man, that sounds good to me. Whatever you like, I like it too. What kind of music do you like? Well, I like Western music. Well, hot dogs, so do I. I, hate, I don't like Western music. So whatever you were, I was. I was a chameleon. And I was that way all of my young life. Then one day, I realized that's just not real. I'm being somebody else, and they're going to eventually find out who I am. If they stay with me long enough, they'll discover who I am and what I am. I can't wear the mask all the time. And so by the time I met Marie, who became my wife, I had made a decision, just be yourself. So when I would ask Marie to go out, I wouldn't say, where do you want to go? I would say, I'm going somewhere. Would you like to go with me? If we went somewhere to eat, I'd say, how much money do you have? <laughs> what do you want to eat? Oh, I was in the mood for steak. Go get some more. No, I'd say, where do you want? You know, I wouldn't say, where do you want to go? I'd say, I'm going to go get some Italian, or I'm going to do. That's what I did. And, and I figured it like this. I figured, this, if she likes me, She's going to like me. She's going to like the real person. This is who I am. 
not the pretend David who's trying to be, you know, Rico Suave with her. I'm going to be just me. She's going to like me. She's going to like the things about me or dislike the real things about me. That's how I was, and that's how I am. What you see is what you get because I, I just got tired of playing that game where you're trying to be everybody's best friend. You're trying to be everybody. I don't want to be. I just want to be who I am in the Lord. And so that's how it was with Marie. And guess what? That's what I brought into ministry. So what I am is what I am. I, I, when we started this church, I began to pray. I said, Lord, you know, people are coming from other Calvary ministries, and I, I don't know what they're expecting. Do they expect me to be like Chuck Smith, or do they expect me to be like Greg Laurie or Raul Reese, what would they expect me to be? And the Lord said, I made you unique. You are who you are. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. And that's a key in ministry. It really is. It's a key in serving the Lord. Just be who you are. How has God worked in you? That's real. That's real. You don't have to talk about what God did in somebody else. You know, oh, I heard this story. This bar. You don't have to. What did God do in you? What is God doing in you? Be yourself. Be real. Because somebody once said, have you ever wanted to be somebody else? Well, if you've wanted to be somebody else, have you ever stopped to think that if you were somebody else, then one of you isn't necessary? (laughs) That's true. So just be who you are by the grace of God and let the Lord work in you. Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. Don't pattern yourself after someone else. Let the Lord fashion you into what he wants you to be. Now, something you might miss when you look at this in verse 19 again is when Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. We have a very personalized way of thinking today. We think in terms of individuals. So we may think as we're reading this that Jesus is speaking to me on a personal level, but in reality, when he says, I will make you, he's speaking about Andrew and James, John, Simon Peter. In other words, Christianity isn't about the individual. Christianity is corporate. It's about the body of Christ. He's not saying, in other words, Uh, Simon Peter, I'm making you and you alone a fisher of men. He's not saying that to James or John or Andrew. He's saying that to them. And so that word is a word that goes out to all of us. Ministry is a team effort. You have a baseball team or a football team, a basketball team. But what we have today is we have taken the idea of team and we've lost it. And so When we talk about the Lakers, we don't just say losers. When we talk about the Lakers, (laughs) we think Kobe Bryant and the losers. Kobe Bryant? I thought Kobe was on a team. I thought there were five men on that team, on that court at that time. Put Kobe by himself and see what happens. Well, it won't change an awful lot, will it? He'll lose. Baseball. All we talk about that pitcher, that pitcher can throw 105 miles an hour. But if you don't have a catcher, you're going to be hurting that, that umpire a lot. You need a catcher. You know, look at anything that requires a team. Anything. And instead of us lifting up one individual... There's only one we should lift, don't you think? And that's Jesus Christ. He's the one who should be lifted. The rest of us are just part of the group. That's what we are. And each of us have an individual ministry that God blesses. But we need each other. We connect. And we have to. And so when he's speaking concerning ministry, be careful not to elevate one person into superstardom because then the elevation of one is the bringing down of somebody else. We all are in this together. And we work together. What do they do? Well, they immediately leave their nets and they follow him. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of things more. Because in verses 21 and 22, you see him calling James and John. And I want to show you a couple things there. But I really want to spend time looking at the word mending with you. And that's how we're going to conclude our study today. Because 
It says in verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John his brother, in the boat with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now notice with me, these were men that were mending their nets. So Christianity is not simply an evangelistic effort alone. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all living creatures, all men. Yes, that's what we're called to do. And I want to develop this with you for a minute. Christianity is, is a message of God of salvation. We are called by God to take it out to the world. But what is God doing in that message? God is reaching into lives and mending them. Mending people is part of ministry. And sometimes what happens in churches is we can get so caught up trying to fill the pews that we leave the pews filled with empty people. They're there. Their bodies are there. We've gone through all of our programs to get them in there. But they're still empty. Because Christianity is more than simply reaching out. It is actually reaching out, touching, and bringing healing to lives. Mending people is part of ministry. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 21, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. The eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. To heal the brokenhearted. When Jesus says that the spirit of the Lord was upon him to heal the brokenhearted, the words brokenhearted speaks of the crushed, the crippled, or the wrecked people in the world. Jesus Christ came to mend that which was broken. To mend, when it speaks here of mending their nets, that word mend, it means to repair or to complete, to, to repair what was broken or torn. Ethically, it means to strengthen or to complete, to make a person what they ought to be. He has given some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. The word equipping in Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, for the equipping of the saints. The word equipping is the same word that is translated mending. For the mending of the saints. Why are you supposed to bring a word that brings mending because that's what needs the gospel. Broken, crushed, wrecked lives. It's not just going out with your Bible street witnessing or door-to-door -door witnessing and then chalking up one more sinner coming to faith and then bragging about bringing them to faith in Christ. It's bringing them a message that heals a broken heart. That's what the gospel does. It heals the broken Jesus came to mend. And that's what he does. Jesus goes to the city of Capernaum. He enters into a synagogue. In that synagogue is a demonized man. And Jesus delivers him. Later, Jesus visits Simon Peter's house. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is, is ill. Jesus heals her. Later on in his ministry, a leper approaches him. Moved by compassion, Jesus cleanses him. Later, he encounters a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus on the side of a road. Jesus was walking, and, and I call it the Christian parade, was lined up with him. And as Jesus is walking, and people are jostling for attention, listening carefully as he's walking, they, they pass by a man. His name is Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus hears the commotion. He says, what's going on? And somebody says, 
Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he begins to cry out loudly. He says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And people who hear this, Bartimaeus, begin to cry. They, they turn to him. The scripture makes it clear. They say to him, be quiet. Don't bother the master. But he cries out all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops. And as he stops, the parade stops. And he turns, bring him to me. He casts away everything and he gets up and he finds his way to Christ. What would you have me to do for you? Lord, that I might receive my sight. Let it be done according to your faith. From that moment, he receives his sight. That's what Jesus does. In the midst of the jostling crowd, the commotion, the people walking by admiring him, his ear was open to the cry of a blind man on the side of the road that other people were saying to be silenced. A woman is brought to Jesus. The religious leaders had been looking for an opportunity. They wanted to find an accusation against Christ, and they knew that they could find it with this woman because... This woman was well known for her immorality, her infidelities. And so they grab her and they bring her to Jesus. As Jesus is ministering and they cast her at his feet and they say, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And Moses in his law says that such should be stoned, but we're asking you, what should we do? And you can see all these people there are watching Christ as he's ministering. What is he going to do? The Bible tells us very clearly what he does. He gets down and he writes. It doesn't tell us what he writes. It's the only time in Scripture that you find Jesus actually writing anything. He writes and he stands up again. Which one of you is without sin? Now let the first one without sin, I'll let him be the first one to cast a stone. That's how he dealt with it. From the oldest to the youngest, they melt away out of shame. Because not a single perfect person was standing there. Woman, where are your accusers? Do you have none? Because he knew that without an accusation, then Moses' law would not be able to be fulfilled as it pertained to that particular sin. Where are your accusers? Do you have none? She says, none, Lord. Neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Did he give her permission to go back into adultery? No. He said, go and sin no more. He didn't give her an excuse to remain immoral. He set her free from immorality. That's what he does. Jesus is at a dinner party. Simon the Pharisees invited him. And Jesus is seated there next to Simon. When a woman comes in, she stands there looking around. Finally, her eyes find Jesus, and she goes to him. And as she comes, she begins to weep. She begins to weep uncontrollably. And the tears begin to flood from her eyes to her chin begin to drip onto his feet as she's standing over him. She becomes aware of the fact that her tears have, have landed on his feet. She bends down, undoes her hair, dries his feet as she's holding his feet in her hand. She begins to kiss his feet. Simon's looking. This Pharisee, this man were truly a prophet. He'd know who and what manner of woman this is that is touching him. She's a sinner. Simon, I have something to say to you. I'll say on. Jesus speaks about two men who owed a great sum and won a lesser sum to the same lender. And he says, the one who had the money owed to him completely forgave both of them. I want to ask you a question, Simon. Which one is going to love him the most? And Simon says, well, I suppose the one who was forgiven the most. And Jesus made it very clear. He said, you didn't even give me the customary greetings of a kiss, oil of any sort, washing my feet. He didn't do any of that. This woman here did all of that. The things that you left undone, she has done. And you want to know why? Because as great as a sinner she is, as great of a sinner as she is, she also loves much because the one who's been forgiven much, that same loves much. Loves much. <laughs> Beloved disciple speaking to Jesus on one occasion says, though all forsake you, I never will. I would die for you. Would you really, Simon? 
I'm saying to you, before the rooster crows twice tonight, you will deny me three times. I would never do that. I would even die for you. Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you. He's prayed for you. And he's obtained you that he may sift you even as wheat is sifted. But I have prayed for you that your strength does not fail. And after you've been converted, strengthen your brethren. What did Simon do? He denied the Lord three times. This broken man. What did Jesus do? Jesus makes a special trip to Simon to ask him a question. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You know I do. Feed my lambs. Tend the sheep. I restore you. That's the Savior that we serve. That's the Savior that we worship. Gracious, loving, kind, and forgiving. He mends the nets. He mends the nets. The broken net, he repairs. The gospel is intended to mend nets. The broken lives, if I were to ask people, if I said, close your eyes, which I won't do, but if I were to say, close your eyes, Ladies, how many of you have been hurt by a man? Little boys, how many of you have been abused? How many of you have been beaten? How many of you were abandoned? How many of you remember a Christmas when a father said, I'll be there, and he never showed up? How many of you have been under that, seen that Christmas tree with nothing under it? You didn't even have the tree. You just had nothing. Many of you. How many of you had a mother who said, I love you, but beat you? How many of you have been hurt, broken, mangled, torn up, discarded, left on the side of the road? All of us, to one degree or another, have been hurt. All of us. And Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. That's what the gospel does. That's what it does. And that's the message of the gospel. That's what God calls us to. We haven't been called to be the world's judges. We've been called to save them from judgment. One of the things about the word saved that you may not know, is like when you read John 3, 16, 17, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That word saved, so it's so. It's a Greek word that means brought to health or healed or made complete. Salvation is about making you complete, about healing that brokenness in your life. God can do that. God can give you a new mind. He can give you a new spirit. He can take you, even if you've been very immoral, and make you as pure as a virgin. He can wash you and cleanse you and make you new. He does it through the power of the gospel. And these men were to send, he was sending them out. He says, you are becoming fishers of men. You will catch them alive and set them free. He wasn't saying you're going to catch them and they're going to die and you're going to eat them. He's saying you're going to catch them alive and you will set them free. That's what you're going to do. Leave your daddy behind. Leave your business behind. You're following me. And you will find a thrill in your life by following me. A thrill that you would never have had in your business. A thrill that you'd never have in any other way. You will be thrilled to the end of your life as you follow me. Bringing this message of healing. The Bible says the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That word convert means to restore or to heal. It's the word of God that heals the soul. So we have been mended. And as we are mended, we go forth to share his great love with others that they too might be mended. All we are are beggars who know where there's a good place that has a free meal and we're inviting our friends to it so you can have that meal along with me a meal that's been provided by God himself. All you need to do is ask. God, forgive me. May I have that? And he'll say, it's prepared for you. Come, it's yours.